Hello, I'm John Martin. I'm trying to raise public awareness of a new paradigm in medicine and science, one that is based on the proven existence of stealth adaptive viruses and on a non-food source of cellular energy that I refer to as the alternative cellular energy pathway. Over the last several weeks, I've uploaded five detailed videos to YouTube. They describe the research leading to the detection and the molecular characterization of certain stealth adapted viruses. It was suggested that I should add yet another video, this one to give somewhat of a background on the training and qualifications that I have to be discussing this topic. I'm happy to do so, especially if it will encourage others to view those videos. I was born in Sydney, Australia. This was the street address. We live well within a half a mile of Bondi Beach, probably the most famous beach in Australia. When I was 10, my family moved us to Brisbane, the capital of Queensland, where we stayed for two years. We then moved to Adelaide for the capital of South Australia, stayed there for two years, and then moved back to Brisbane. I finished my high school in Brisbane and gained entry into the University of Queensland Medical School. But at the end of the year, the family moved once more, this time back to Sydney, so I transferred to the University of Sydney Medical School. Now at the time, the medical education comprised six years. There was an option for certain students if they wanted to, to take an additional year, an elective year, and try their hand at research. I did that at the end of the fourth year, and uh, for that I received the Bachelor of Science Medical Degree, and I also accomplished the first, my first publication. I went back to medical school for the fifth and sixth year. I did the best or achieved the highest grade in the final examination offered in the medical school, and for that uh, we graduated with an MBBS, the equivalent of the American MD degree. Now, myself and four other honored graduates were uh, joined the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, not as a regular junior resident, but as a professorial resident. The difference being that normally a junior resident worked directly under the supervision of a senior resident. We were allowed to work directly under senior physicians. We rotated to each of us working with the head of medicine, surgery, psychiatry, neurosurgery, and emergency medicine. In addition, in that first year, I took it, had the initiative to go to Papua New Guinea in the Highland area where I knew a disease was being investigated called Kuru. K-U-R-U, and I spent a month up there doing clinical studies. I continued with a second year of residency at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, but then decided on a research career in medical research. I was offered a fellowship to join the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne, Australia, as part of the University of Melbourne. I worked with Dr. Jacques Miller, who was the individual who discovered the important role of the thymus in cellular immunology. The institute director of the time, Dr. Gus Nossel, and he had taken that leadership position from Sir MacFarlane Burnett. Sir MacFarlane Burnett had received the Nobel Prize for his clonal selection theory in immunology. I graduated with my PhD degree at 90, in uh, the end of 1969, and then was offered a position as a Fogarty Fellow to work at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Bethesda, Maryland. I worked with a Dr. Baruch Benassara on research studies that led to his receiving a Nobel Prize. After the first year at uh, NIH, Dr. Ben Asheroff accepted a position as Chairman of Pathology at Harvard Medical School and he asked if I might join him for a few months to complete some experiments. I did that. I then returned back to the NIH, specifically 
to the National Cancer Institute to fill out the remaining time on my J-1 visa. That had a limitation of up to three years of training in the United States. Rather than going directly back to Australia, I opted to go to England and work at the University College London with, again, another prominent immunologist, Dr. Av Mitchison. I also got married before leaving the United States to a lady I met at the NIH. We both worked in the laboratory of Dr. Mitchison in England. At the end of about two and a quarter years, I was reissued with another J-1 visa and could return back to the United States, which I did coming back to the National Cancer Institute. My wife came back to NIH also, and she worked with Dr. Marshall Nirenberg, a Nobel laureate. At, at that time, I was offered a position to work at the Bureau of Biologics. This is a component of the Food and Drug Administration that was located on the NIH campus. The position um, I held was that of laboratory director of a viral oncology laboratory, oncology being cancer-causing uh, viruses. So the idea was F uh, FDA to have the ability to address concerns about possible cancer-causing viruses in vaccines. While in the Bureau of Biologics, I had several trips back to Australia, one of which they uh, suggested to me coming back to Australia to run the laboratory in a newly established Commonwealth Institute of Health. I went through the process, but as a family decision, decided not to, but rather to stay in the United States. It was important that I revived or activated my medical training, and I was hugely fortunate to be appointed as an associate professor at the Uniform Services University of the Health Science, or for the Health Sciences. That's located in Bethesda. What it did was allowed me to spend time at the National Naval Medical Center, also in Bethesda, and undertake studies towards the pathology residency. I received my um, pathology boards both in anatomic pathology and in clinical pathology. I extended the training to um, get some specialty certification in medical microbiology and in immunopathology. All in all, I think there's only ever been 200 American pathologists qualifying for the boards in medical microbiology and less than 100 with immunopathology boards which is no longer being offered. With those certifications, my wife and I considered various options, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and the decision was made in 1985 to move to Los Angeles. Both my wife and I were appointed as tenured physicians at the University of Southern California School of Medicine. That's where I did my research on the polymerase chain reaction, looking for viruses in patients who had the chronic fatigue syndrome. We found those viruses and began to characterize them. In 1995, I realized that these viruses, some of these viruses, were coming from the cytomegaloviruses of the monkeys used to make polio vaccines. I had reported this to FDA, but I also reported it at a meeting of the, uh, the Institute of Medicine in Washington, D.C. Upon, upon returning back to USC, I was bluntly told I could no longer do any clinical testing for these viruses. There were talk about legal suits against the vaccine manufacturer. Rather than being any way confrontational, I simply took leave from my tenured position, and I'm still formally on leave now. What I next had to do was to organize a private laboratory bringing together the necessary equipment, and I called it the Center for Complex Infectious Diseases. What was then great is I met up with parents who had concerns for their children who had mental illness. They had formed a non-profit, which they called MI Hope, Mental Illness Hope. It was formed in 1988. It had no assets, but it gave me exactly what I wanted. 
a opportunity to do the research within a non-profit institution. It was called MI Hope, but I also used the name Institute of Progressive Medicine. I continued to do patient cultures um, and learning about the virus. In 2002, I probably politically erred one more time in the sense that I specifically tested patients who were blood donors at the University of California, Irvine Blood Donation Center. It was an approved study, but nobody wanted to hear about the results. I was then visited by uh, the inspectors from the California Health Department who told me, honestly, it was at the bequest of the Centers for Disease Control to say, no, you can't do these cultures, they don't, the stealth viruses don't exist, or whatever their reason. That, in fact, was a good thing to the sense that I could switch the focus away from simply detecting these viruses to asking the question, why, if there's no immune defense, are people not just getting progressively sicker? And that led to an understanding of this alternative cellular energy pathway as a very potent non-immunological defense mechanism. I was able to write a fairly comprehensive report in a book entitled Stealth Adapted Viruses, Alternative Cellular Energy, and Kalia Activated Water. It was published in 2014, and I'll explain in later videos about Kalia and how it can activate water. If I had to summarize then, I do have experience in virology. This was the uh, central theme of the time I spent at the Bureau of Biologics, at the National Naval Medical Center, and both at USC and after leaving USC. I very much enjoy culturing viruses, growing bacteria, looking at the effects of viruses and bacteria on cells, both under the regular microscope and even under the electron microscope. I enjoy explaining the research to physicians and other healthcare providers, but even more so to people in unrelated fields, hardcore theoretical physicists or basic chemists, to get ideas from their field of research that might correlate with the research that I'm doing. I have a phenomenal uh, wonderment about nature the excitement of learning new aspects that the way nature works. I've even um, had the, the sense that we are all so privileged to be enjoying this living process. I use the term from Latin, Adamo vivus. Adamo is a Latin word for loving vivus life, for loving life. And I try to convey this to the patients whom I uh, do have contact with. I'm also hugely grateful for having had this research career, and particularly in the last several years, for the encouragement to keep on pushing against some of the barriers that have been, resist uh, have been placed. I have clearly a sense of disdain for those people who put barriers in place. You can't criticize vaccines these viruses can't exist, you're not really a virologist, etc., etc. Um, and it comes home to the fact that there's an underlying desire to help people who would benefit from this research. I want to make this point. Ten years ago, I wrote a short comment about criminal behavior potentially being due to stealth-adapted viral infections. I wrote it on the occasion of the Sandy Hook school shooting, again in 2012. We just had this Udolvi uh, killing in Texas. I could write the same thing. But what it means is that that whole 10-year period I've not achieved what ought to have been achieved, a more widespread recognition and willingness to pursue research on stealth-adapted viruses. That leaves me with the option of making an effort to re-establish or establish a virus culture facility that could do the DNA, RNA sequencing that would then further characterize stealth adapted viruses. I'm very open to inquiries or 
um, possible support for proceeding along this line. Please address your comments to my email. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you will go back and look at the five previous videos. Thank you.